Thank you for joining me for another episode of Let There Be Talk. You can now find all of my podcasts absolutely free on my podcast network, cactusradionetwork.com, including The Grail, Dark Fonzie, At Home with Byron Katie, and Let There Be Talk, all for free at cactusradionetwork.com. Thank you for your support, and I cannot thank you enough for leaving uh, reviews and subscribing and all of that stuff. So you guys kick ass. Let's keep it going. Keep spreading the word, grassroots style. Tell a friend we've got something for you here at the CactusRadioNetwork.com. Time to dip into another Bay Area legend right here on the podcast today. I cannot believe how much gold has come out of the Bay Area when it comes to music. And I will say it over and over and over. There is no better place than the Bay Area when it comes to all different music over all these years I've been alive. From the hippie scene to the metal scene to the punk rock scene, the thrash metal scene, all of that. It just dominates, man. San Francisco Bay Area should be nominated and inducted into the hall of fame anyway i cannot even tell you how excited i am to have this guest on today lars Fredriksen is here from rancid and i will tell you this in 1994 a little smoking tune called salvation hit the radio and i was immediately who the hell is this I was knee-deep, of course, into grunge, and I was also rocking all kinds of other stuff at the time, like Blind Melon and and Wallflowers and, you know, Counting Crows. Yeah, yeah, if you're punk rock and you're listening to this, you're like, oh, what? Yeah, I listen to all kinds of music because I'm into good songs. That is what it's about, a crushing song. And when Salvation came on, I immediately was like, who is this? And I bought Let's Go and immediately started rocking it. And I could not get enough of it. I love Salvation, Gunshot, Ghetto Box. It was all there. I understood where it was coming from. And it was reminding me of my love of The Clash and Dead Kennedys and all of that catchy, radical punk rock that I love. I don't talk about it a lot because... It's not like I'm an expert at punk rock, but I was around it, I saw it live, and I loved it, and when I get into it, I'll dive deep into it for months at a time and be hooked, especially after I saw that Dave Grohl Sonic Highways, I really got into like all that DC stuff and Fugazi and all that, and and that's what's great about music. It's whenever you find it in life, it, it, it just opens up your whole brain to, oh, wow, I, I, I forgot about this or I missed this or I remembered this. I love it. Anyway, so it was great to dive back down into Rancid over these last couple of weeks and fall back in love with it. It's, it's been a while since I've listened to them. Of course, they have the monster masterpiece, And Out Come the Wolves, which was uh, in 1995. And Time Bomb, to me, is just a damn classic. Roots Radical, Rudy Soho. I mean, this record is a monster. And you got to think about that whole Gilman scene thing that was happening. I missed that because I was older. I wasn't hanging out at Gilman Street during the uh, Green Day era or the Rancid era. But I love all of that and the songwriting that comes out of there. It's just amazing. These little, these little, you know, spots on the earth where a scene happens and it erupts. The earth is so big and you got to think about like, oh yeah, at one time, this is where some of the greatest songs and punk rock energy came out of right here in Berkeley. Boom. You know? Anyway, thank you, Lars, for doing the show. It was great to talk to you. And uh, not only does he play with Rancid, but he has a million projects. He has produced tons of bands and he has a brand new EP coming out at the end of the month to victory with some cool covers and you know reworked up versions of songs you're gonna dig it 
He's got some great new videos out right now. So dive all into Lars and check out uh, the new Rancid record that's coming out, the 10th album pretty soon. So wow, a lot of good stuff for him and I'm glad they're working nonstop after all these years. Hey, I'm coming to, well, I'm in Vegas right now all week, the Comedy Cellar. Yes, Monday through Sunday, I will be here at the Rio Hotel, posted up with my dog, Gertie, writing comedy, working on comedy, 100% engulfed in stand-up comedy right here, two shows a night. Get your tickets. Come down and see me at the Comedy Cellar all this week. And then I am headed to Denver, Colorado, to the most prestigious club in America, the Denver Comedy Works. I hope... You guys can tell anyone you know that lives in Denver or the Denver area to come see me. November 26, 27, 28. Tickets available at deandelray.com for all my shows. Also, the holidays are coming. Get yourself some Dean Del Rey merch. Dark Fonzie shirts, some Gertie hoodies. The Grail has a shirt now and the great Dean Del Rey Perry Shaw collab shirt. They're all there at my website, deandelray.com. I want to thank everybody that came out to the shows in Portland and Bend. It was incredible. And uh, I can't thank you guys enough. And thanks to my man, Shailen McDonough, for kicking ass in the feature spot. And thank you, the Bossa Nova Ballroom and Volcanic, what was that place? The Volcanic Pub or something in Bend. Man. Brains fried this morning. Sorry. But great, great shows. Trying to get better headlining. That's my goal. I want to be a monster headliner. I want to be crushing it out there. <laughs> I just want to make you guys laugh and have some fun. We're here one time. One time only. So get out of the house. Go see some shows. Big love to some of the Patreoners that came out. It was so great to meet them face-to-face. Yob Toff was in the house. Brandon Belt, the music encyclopedia. Emily was there and a few other great, great um, Patreoners. Also, damn, I wish I could remember the guy's name that drew... Oh, wait, I might have it here. He painted Gertie, and it was so cool. It's such a cool painting of Gertie here. I think I got his name right here. Let's get it, in case you want to get your pet uh, painted. His name is uh, BJ Plum. Check it out. Great job, buddy. Lots of love out there on the Patreon. I'll be doing a Zoom Fest this week and a bonus episode. Thank you, Emily Thorner, for bumping up your pledge. You are a goddess. Frank Bernacki, you kick ass. This episode is brought to you by Standard and Strange, my one-stop denim shop. I get all my denim, my boots, my leather jackets from StandardandStrange.com, and they just opened in New York City. And we are giving away a Y2 leather. Go to standardandstrange.com slash Delray and leave your email. They're not going to sell it or anything. And we will be giving away a leather jacket this week. So get on it. Standardandstrange.com slash Delray. I hope to see you guys out at the shows. I hope you enjoy this episode. I know you will. It is kick-ass. One last thing, I did just drop a new episode of The Grail, and it has McCroskey Mattress Company, which is a bizarre but fantastic, great guest. I love this story, so don't miss that. Thank you, Lars. Once again, here he is. The candles are lit for episode number 618. Enjoy live, people. What is going on, my man? I was, uh, well, today it's school conferences, so um, I thought both boys were staying home, and then I realized and my uh, 14-year-old like, is like, yo, Dad, why aren't we at school? I'm like, fuck, are you kidding me? And he's like, no, I got to be at school. So I just ran him to school as fast as I could. So I'm like, 
<laughs> you know what I mean? Are you a cool dad? Fucking I am a cool dad. <laughs> I'm the coolest dad. I just, I'm just wondering, sometimes, you know, you, you meet like rock and rollers that are wild men. And then they're like, they're like the opposite around their, you know, like, oh, cause they were so crazy growing up. Yeah. I mean, I feel like, you know, that's been a big challenge for me just because it's like they come from my bloodline. Right. So you're, you're, you're always like, okay. I mean, my, my, my 10 year old, he's, he's, a, he's more like me personality wise. He's a little bit more, uh, you say boisterous. Yeah. Um, and, but my 14 year old, he's very, he's super smart. He's more like my brother, you know? And, uh, but you got to remember that they're not going to have your childhood. Like that's the most important thing. It's like they're, you know, your childhood is not going to be, you know, it has in no way, shape, or form should should uh, influence your parenting on these kids who are not obviously having your childhood. They got, you know, obviously both parents are in the picture and you know things like that. So and there's a lot of love and support in this house, you know. And me and my partner try to bring that to them, and you know, she's a great you know, stepmother and things like that. So it's like, it's a whole different environment than I ever had. So with that being said. So they won't be, they won't be successful musicians then. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know. You never know. I mean, I mean, it's, I, I don't, the, the thing most important is that they're not fucking assholes. Right. You know what I mean, I, I don't care what they do. You know, it's, that's not important to me. It's like, just don't be a fucking asshole and, you know, treat people as you would want to be treated because I mean, you know, being uh, a, a child of somebody, you know, maybe who's in the public eyes is hard enough as it is, you know what I mean? And then you add like entitlement issues and assholeness to it. It's like, you're going to, that's going to, you know, that's a recipe for a total shit storm in your, you know, and it's like, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I, my kids are pretty nice. They have really good manners. They're not, they're, they're, they're very, uh, I mean, every, every child I think has some sense of entitlement to some degree, but I think it's like, they're not, you know, I'm not from that generation of everybody gets a trophy and let's, you know, in a safe space and, uh, you know, trigger words and all that other bullshit. I'm from a place where it's like, if you won the championship, that's when you got the trophy, you know what right. I mean? So, right. Something so to I, strive for, something to strive for, man. Exactly. I never understood a fourth place pr trophy. I don't get that. That's fucking stupid, and that's kind of I what I feel is kind of wrong with what's what's our what our society has become. You know, I think that's why you have so much. You know, I mean, it's like comedians can't tell jokes, musicians can't play songs, people don't want to say. You know, if you're, it, it's so fucking polarized. You know, what I mean, and it's it's stupid, and like yeah. freedom of speech is like somehow a bad thing now. You know, it's like it's fucking <laughs> ridiculous. Yeah. You know. Well, also, I I I. I think that most people forget the number one thing about humans are we're humans and right. humans make mistakes. And now you are just completely thrown to the lions for any mistake. And, and, and I'm like, wait a minute. So the people pointing the finger, are you telling me you've never made a mistake? And then sure enough, they start voice or, you know, given their voice and then you look back on them and like oh well here's a tweet from 2010 <laughs> white lady karen you know and then they're like ah well i think those you know who live in what is it that my mom used to say those who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones right, right. so and my mom you know god rest her soul or i should say odin bless her soul but uh you know, I mean, it's like my mom, you know, grew up in Nazi occupied Denmark in World War II and saw her family get shot in front of her, right? At yeah. four or five years old. Like, you're telling me your fucking life is harder than that? Yeah. Yeah. You know, fuck you. Yeah. you know I mean, you know, so my life was definitely not harder than that. She made, you know, and to go back to the original children question, it's like my life was made better from her, from her life, right? Her experience. And now it's my job for these kids, you know? Yeah. So, Let's let's get into it a little bit here. Yeah. I grew up in the Bay Area, of course, and it's pretty fucking mind boggling. And and I'm going to say this, and I've said it before on this show. I think the Bay Area is the most underrated music scene of all time for the amount of music that I don't think more music has come out of anywhere than the Bay Area as far as massive amounts of success 
and different styles. And over the years, starting back with the dead and airplane and that 60s hippie shit. And then you get into, you know, the late 70s into the 80s of like Huey Lewis. And, and, and then if you're looking at dead Kennedys and the Mabuhay scene, that's a that's a great successful story. And then, of course, Metallica and the entire thrash industry. Yeah. And then you get into Gilman Street and and Green Day and Rancid. It is unreal. And, and I'm and I'm fast tracking. There's so many bands. I sat down one day and was like, whoa, look at the amount of music out of this out of this area. Yeah, I mean, it's nuts, but I think it's like the perfect melting pot for these types of things to happen because you have so many different, you know, first of all, like a lot of these places where these bands come from a very blue collar working class, right. you know what I mean? And I think that's that's very uh, important to mention, you know, because I, and I feel like with that, that sort of, and a lot of those bands that you're talking about, even the hippie ones had a little grit to them. Oh, big you know time. I mean? I, and I love the dead now, you know, I just didn't understand them as a young kid. Yeah, I still don't understand them. And I'm happy to say on the show, I still don't get the fucking Grateful Dead, never will. And I, in so moving fast forward, like, you know, you did, like you mentioned Metallica, like, of course, two of them from Southern California, but they needed the Bay Area influence, you know, with Burton and, uh, uh, not Hatfield, uh, Come on, Kirk come Hammett. On. Kirk Hammett. Jesus yeah. fucking Christ from Exodus. Like they needed that to be that cohesive unit. And it's like now they're the biggest fucking band on planet Earth. Maybe beside, I mean, arguably maybe ACDC, right? Right. So it's like, so I mean, I feel like it's just an energy here, you know, because we've been sort of the, you know, think about all the social revolutions that have come from this, from this area, you know, uh, you know, equality, uh, you know. I mean, look, I mean, look at the, I mean, even it's even in the sports teams, like the Raiders or the A's, you know what I mean? Or earthquakes or warriors, you know I mean? So I'm probably more towards the A's and the earthquake or uh, uh, the Raiders, but I mean, you know, they're part of like these social revolutions in a lot of ways. And I think that that spirit, you know, within the, 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 the Bay area, whether it be the South Bay or the East Bay or, or San Francisco area, which is the West, you know? So it's like, I think that it's just a cultural melting pot. We accept a lot more shit. We're, we're a little bit more, um, we've always been on, on the forward thought, you know, train, you know, we've always like, you know, punk rock started here in gay clubs. You know what I mean? Harvey Milk was the biggest punk rocker there was, you know? And, well, the, you know, there you go. So it's like, there, there were so many social movements here and there always has been, and there's been room for it all. Even at fucking crazy, it was, there was still room for, for you spiritually, for instance, like the Moonies and the fucking, yeah. <laughs> the, you yeah. know, Jim whatever. Jones, Jim Jones. <laughs> I mean, the that was, you know, that was a cult, you know, whatever. Yeah. Uh, I know the church is right up here, but it's like, if you think about, then that also did not have a very good ending, but no, but, no, <laughs> it didn't. But, but the people were open-minded to right. uh, all kinds of different, different stuff in the Bay Area, And we must, uh, we must put a big giant uh, exclamation point here of, uh, y- you know, this was blue collar Bay area, not yeah. now. And now is a totally different Bay area. But back then, you know, you had Hayward, Fremont, Berkeley, you had uh, San, San, Fran- yeah. Yeah. San Francisco. San- no one wanted to live there. It was blue no. collar. That's where the plumbers and the electricians live because everybody rich wanted to live in Mill Valley and Walnut Creek. They went north up in Marin County. I mean, that's why all everybody went up there. Anybody who had any money left the city and moved up north. And they, they, and they still kind of do that. So, you know, right now in the city, the shape of it, you know, obviously it's, since the pandemic, it's changed a lot, too, because a lot of people moved out. Yeah. Are you and- living in the city? I live in the city. I've been living here since 96. Oh, I love it. So, I love it. But, uh, you know, I, I ran away when I ran away from home. This is where I came. You know what I mean? It's like so this for me, you know, I only grew up about 50 miles south of here in Campbell, which yeah. was just, you know, just, a, you know, a little town. Basically, it was a suburb. So it was a suburb of San Jose, yeah. basically. And I mean, even though we had our own police department, our own fire department, and you know, we were our own thing. You know, it was it was it was a way different experience coming up here as a kid than living here as an adult now, you know. So right. Right. One day I I got it, you know, but I mean, 
the allure of it, you know, I think is sort of worn away for me. You know, I feel like, I feel like people, you know, I remember, you know, just dealing with in schools and stuff like that. And there was a school that, that my oldest had gone to and, and, and the parents were talking about how they wanted to move to the mission and because of its edginess. And they were literally complaining about it, about how, you know, there's none of that edginess there. And I said, that's because you edged all the fucking edge out. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. and they're like, huh? And my buddy who grew up here in San Francisco just started laughing because, uh, you know, because that's what they, they come here for this, you know, utopian idea of like Patagonia and Lululemon. And this is the way we need to think. And this is the way we need to vote. And this is the way we need to act and blah, 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 blah. They come here with this preconceived notion that kind of the people who are actually from here, you know, are maybe not necessarily congruent with with what they think that they're supposed to be like once they get here, you know, and it's that's not everybody, you know, that's just a small minority, of course. But yeah, well, that that city really changed. Uh, I mean, I lived there, you know, most of my life. And it's like once the first wave of the dot com hits and, and shit closes like Paradise Lounge and DNA yeah. Lounge yeah. and Night Break is gone and the yeah. I-Beam is gone and the greed of the of the landlords were like, well, we'll just get some uh, startups in here and we'll charge them a hundred grand a month. And then those startups collapsed and then it became a ghost town. And then mm. it kind of was cool for a little while yeah. again, like, oh, this is kind of back to the old days. And then here comes Mach 2 of the techies. Next thing you know. It's a complete shit storm now of like, you know, $5,000 one bedrooms and shit. It's come down because of the pandemic. But right before the pandemic, it was absolutely ridiculous. And there was zero edge in there is, is really correct. And the music and art scene was long gone. They had moved wherever they could survive places yeah. like way outside, like Modesto or anything they could go to, you know? Yeah. Stockton. You yeah. Know what I mean, Sacramento. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was coming to a point where my mom, you know, shortly before she passed was getting priced out of her shitty fucked up apartment. And it's just because there's so much greed and, you know what I mean? And I understand that, that this is also the price of progression. Right. I get it too. And I'm not that guy. There's two streets on it. You know, you're a landlord for years. You've been getting $800 for rent. Maybe the people don't pay rent or whatever. And you're trying to get through it. And all of a sudden you got an opportunity to make 5,000 on your apartment. I get hey, it's two way street. I get it. But I don't get uh, the, the whole thing of, of, well, everything's gone. You know, back in the day, there was hippies there. There'd be rich people. There'd be blue collar. There would be minorities, uh, all different flavors. You know, I'd go to the mission and it'd be radical. Then I'd go to North Beach and I could get some Italian food and hang right. out. It was like it was like you're in Europe. You know what I mean? Different yeah. areas. You're like, this is wild. Yeah, I mean, but I think there's still a little bit of an element of that's coming back now, you know, which I kind of like. It's a, it's getting a little bit more grimy around here. Oh, you yeah. Know, you can, you can kind of tell. And it's a little bit more familiar to me, you know. I think a lot more people are shocked by it. The people who maybe haven't been here for, you know, 10 years or so, or, or, you know, have seen it. So it's like coming up here as a kid and coming to shows and stuff, you know, whether it be at the on Broadway or the Mab or, you know, whatever it was, you know, any, you know, fucking club, it, you know, it was, it was definitely a different place. You know, it was definitely a different vibe. It was, it was, it was, uh, it could be borderline scary at times. You know what I mean? If you weren't watching out for the fucking, the, the bums who would fucking rob you, you had to watch out for the police who would just beat you for no fucking reason. So, and, you know, I, I would say that a lot has changed since then for the better, but there's also that, you know, it ebbs and flows, right? There's always a yin and a yang. So where things progress and become better, there's also that element of of shittiness that that follows it, and that's just kind of the balance of life, where the and how the pendulum swings. You know, yeah. every once in a while, it's going to come straight to the middle, but it's always going to go over here or go over here. You know, what I mean, we've seen it. You know, we've been around a few decades, huh? Yeah, absolutely. Now, I was, uh, you know, in it, heavily into the Mabuhe and the Stone scene and the Omni. And the rock on Broadway and the I beam, the night break, those were my stomping grounds, bottom of the hill. But I never, ever spent time over in Gilman because I think I was just had 
I, I was just older, you know, I'm 55. Right. So Gilman started to happen. And I, you know, of course, knew about Gilman Street and I and heard about it nonstop. And it just really kind of blew my mind. The music that was coming out of there, the songwriting of, say, you guys and Billy Joe and Green Day and stuff. And uh, even at some of that earlier stuff that was happening in there, you know, um, I had Mikey Weiss on from Dance Hall Crashers. And, you know, he's talking about the Gilman Street, but you were in there. And was it like kind of a uh, like a flavor of CBGBs? I, I don't know if you ever went to CBGBs, but was it just kind of like a, a brotherhood in there, a family? And then it, uh, it just kind of uh, it seemed super organic and just exploded. Well, I think Matt and Tim would be better um, historians on that because, I mean, I was a South Bay kid. So, of course, of course. Were you going to the Cactus Club and stuff? Yeah, Cactus and, and what well, fucking the, uh, oh God, the tavern. What was it called? Uh, oh, Jesus. Uh, Marsugis and. Uh, yeah, yeah. One oh, Step God. Beyond. Did you go there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I saw yeah. many shows in One Step yeah. Beyond. You know, I saw yeah. Social Distortion there. Yeah. I actually saw at One Step Beyond, I saw Ice. T. Yeah. Body count. No, Ice T, Houdini, Egypt. It was one of my first rap shows because my best friend, Wade Mendoza, he was into the, like, to the two turntables. And that's how I heard running DMC for the first time. I was into punk and he was into, you know, he, you know, he liked Prince and, and a lot of like the soul shit, but then he also liked all the hip hop. So that's how I heard, you know, all the Sugar Hill gang, oh, you yeah. know, I heard, I heard White Lions for the first time, you know all these things. And his, his dad actually took me and him to go see it was ice tea, Egyptian lover, Houdini and Africa Mabata and the soul song force me. Right, 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 right. So I remember I was like, I had a Mohawk. I was like 11 and it was like, uh, it was fucking wild. Cause I was like literally the only white kid there with a, but you know, and then having a Mohawk and all, all, all the, all the girls were like freaking out on my hair and they're like, Whoa. But, um, so yeah, I went to one step beyond a lot. I mean, that was a lot. I saw that, you know, GVH there. I saw, every, you know, any band that you could possibly see. I used to book that place. Really? Yeah. It was me oh, and shit. Jimmy Arsenal. We were the bookers. So we had oh, it all in there, you know? Gotcha. Gotcha. So, um, I was trying to, uh, trying to get back to that, that the Gilman street, when I started kind of coming around there, it wasn't uh, with any consistency. It wasn't until I, you know, I had joined Rancid by then. And, um, but I think it was a little bit of a different time. I mean, I don't, I, I don't think there wasn't a lot of bands like us going off like that. So no one was really, you know, studded leather jackets and, you know, Mohawks and spiky hair and doing the kind of music that we were doing. We were sort of an anomaly there, you know, cause bands like Jawbreaker and Spit Boy and, uh, you know, I'm trying to think a Tribe 8, you know, yeah, uh, uh, bands that we were friends with, you know, Green Day sort of kind of moved on from there, you know, at that time, even though they might play every once in a while, but they were too big. I mean, they were too good, too big. Uh, I'm trying to think who else would have been around Econo Christ, these, these types of bands. So it was, there was like that kind of scene. And then there was kind of us and we were sort of like, and then there was the hardcore bands, you know, like powerhouse or, you know, I'm trying to think who else was out there, but you know, I think the the bands like uh, I'm trying to think who else would have been around at around that time, you know, with that that were just like in our immediate like peer group kind of thing is is how I'm trying to explain it. So you know, we would we would do shows there, and we would and it would be like the only band that was like us was us. You know what I mean? And sometimes you know, well, we I mean, I remember our first tour, we were playing with nothing but like hardcore bands. You know, so that's how we got in in you know in contact with like Sick of It All and you know, the mad ball and those, all those New York hardcore bands. It's like, because we were playing with a lot of hardcore bands at the time, you know, in their, that first tour, you guys did exactly what the strokes did as far as like you guys, as soon as I saw salvation, the video, I remember the day I was watching, I was like, wow, this is fucking, this is great. It, I knew where it was coming from. Of course, the clash and, the, and that whole era of stuff, but it was definitely your sound and a great fucking song and the and the strokes did the same thing in my eyes where uh leather jackets were dead for years and then the strokes come on and here they are giving you some television type of lou reed new york uh you know leather jacket rock uh you guys did the same thing man it felt authentic 
And it was really radical and, and, a, and a kick in the ass for 1994, you know, because we had grunge and then we had stuff like Blind Melon and Counting Crows and all that. But here comes Rancid and it, it was explosive, man. And, and, it, and it definitely felt authentic and cool. Well, I think it, you know, it, it is, and it, and it still is, you know I mean? It's, be, and I don't, it's like, you can definitely like, you know, there's an old saying, you can take the boy out of Campbell, but you can't take the Campbell out of boy out of the boy. And I, and I think that's the same thing with Ranted. It's like, we kind of grew up working class, you know, we came from this blue call, all of us, you know, including Brandon. So we, you know, for me, my, my experience, I was working poor. I grew up in low income housing, project housing or whatever. So I think there was an, there was a, an urgency or a desperation at that time, you know what I mean? For us and how we clicked together, you know, and that chemistry that happened with us, it was all authentic. You know, that's what we were thinking. What we were, what we were singing about is what we were dealing with. It was very, you know, close to home, you know, it was definitely wearing our hearts on our sleeves, so to speak. So if we had an idea or an opinion, we weren't afraid to share it, you know? So whether it was happening in our personal lives or how we were seeing the world or maybe what was happening with our views politically or whatever it may be, it was coming out, you know what I mean? And I think that, you know, where we all came from and, you know, our history, you know, whether Matt and Tim and Off Ivy, me being in the UK subs or whatever, and, and having these, you know, um, places that we came from and then coming together and making this this thing happened. It was a pretty magical time. And it's still, yeah, it's actually more magical now in a weird way, because, you know, here we are 30 years later and, you know, still doing the same thing, you know, obviously making new records and doing all these things, but we're still, we're better. We're a better live band. We're a better band. Um, I think we're better songwriters. I think we're better everything, you know, and it also gives us the freedom to kind of go out and do our own things. You know, it's like, you know, Matt has his band charger, Tim's obviously done his solo stuff in the transplants, you know, and produces bands like the interrupters. And, and then, you know, I've, I've, you know, obviously released this new EP here and, you know, done, did the bastards, you know, I'm actually wearing a band <laughs> stumper 98. So this is a German band I'm in. I don't even speak German, but I play with them. Right. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I just, I'm, I was a fan of the band and then, you know, I play in the last resort that are, you know, in England, Oxy's been, I run. So, I mean, it's like in the old firm casual. So I've been able to kind of like, spread my um creative wings too and it's always coming back to to rancid because rancid like the mothership in a sense so you know i feel like all of those experiences that we all have brings that chemistry back and when we actually get together and we, you know we bring all that experience to the table i think that's just made us better in the long run you know so you know we're lucky hey what's up we've got an exciting sponsor for you guys today vance global Yes, and I'm not talking about the refrigerator company. Vance rolls the best Delta 8 THC joints and cooks the best edibles. They are a whopping 50 milligrams a serving. If you tried the quote-unquote real stuff in legal states or on the black market, this is way better, cleaner, it's legal, and you're getting the best price. No taxes, no BS, and free shipping. Use my code DEAN. 20 that's d-e-a-n number 20 to save 20 percent off your order at vance-global.com vance-global.com vance global products are made from the organic cbd flower grown in oregon and wisconsin all vance global products contain less than 0.3 percent THC following the FDA legal guidelines. Vance Global's hemp flower is grown in the USA, contains zero pesticides. Our CBD is safe and derived from legal hemp flower, licensed and lab tested three separate times before we even begin the handling process. Yes, get the clean, clean products from vance-global.com. That's code DEAN20 to save 20% off your order at vance, V-A-N-C-E, dash G-L-O-B-A-L.com. All right? Use the code. It helps me. It helps you. And man, what a great new sponsor vance-global.com use the code dean20 and get the real stuff 
I think that what's really amazing is to see a band like Rancid and uh, Metallica and Death Angel. I really oh. love watching Death Angel play right now and having some fierce glory all the way to 2021 right now, just killing it, you know, Grammy nominees and shit. So to see these Bay area bands still out there and crushing it, 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 it's just fantastic, man. I absolutely love seeing it. I, 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 I can't, you know, have more pride in that Bay area. Like, Oh yeah. Another Bay area band coming through, killing it, you know? Well, I love Death Angel. I mean, they're they're good friends of ours. You know what I mean. And, and one of my uh, both mine and Matt's other bands have opened for them during their Christmas shows. And uh, you know, Humana side that record is like next level. And it just shows you how even after thirty plus years, you know, of a band, how you can still you know bring it. And you're right, absolutely right about in Death Angel's case. You know, what I mean, and I want to focus in on them. Of, just because, you know, Metallica is always going to be fucking gigantic, of right? They're, yeah, ma massive. But Testament and Death Angel, they're just out there. Soldiers. And even the new Exodus record, you know, it's yep. like all that Bay Area thrash, which, you know, basically created the genre. Let's just be honest. I mean, the Bay Area thrash is what put it on the fucking map. You know what I mean? And so, and I went on Slayer and, and Metallica and those types of bands, you know, Slayer obviously being a Southern California band, but it, 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 it took Exodus, Testament, Death Angel, these types of bands to put eyes on, you know, bands like Slayer or, or you know, and things like that. So, you know, the first, I remember I, I saw, um, well, I saw, you know, Exodus uh, at Ruthie's, you know, one time when they had, Paul. Off. Yeah. Yeah. And then I saw um, Zetro's, I guess it was his second show at the Mountain View Theater. Oh, yeah. Remember that place? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and I was there to watch with my buddy there to watch a friend of ours band play before them. Right. So, you know, and little did I know, and I was talking to my buddy who I went to the show with and I was like, I was like, I said something, yeah, I just did Zetro's podcast. And he goes, you remember that time we went to see him? I'm like, what time? He goes, when we, we went to go see fucking Meek's thing. And I, and I was like, oh, my God. Right. You know, because it's like it seemed like every weekend I was at a different show. And there was different kinds of music. As long as it was like aggressive, loud and fast. Yeah. You know, that's all I really cared about. And, and yeah, I was probably sitting there judging it a little, you know, cause I'm fucking punk and this is, you know, whatever. And they're just stealing from the punks, but I wasn't so much like that with those thrash bands, especially the Bay Area ones, but there was a lot of other bands that like, I kind of was in, in judgment. <laughs> I'll just be honest. But I mean, that's all kind of sort of, sort of fallen by the wayside. And I think as you get older, well, you that's know, part you of being young, man, you're yeah. just like, you know, well, cause it's your shit. And that's the thing. It's like back when I got into punk rock, you really had to fucking want to be there. You know, it wasn't for, you know, the weak at heart because you were going to get hassled by the fucking jocks at fucking high school or the, or the rich kids from fucking Saratoga, or you're going to, um, you know, you get, uh, police, shit from the fucking police yeah. for skateboarding down the fucking street or whatever, you know what I mean? So it's like, and sometimes you ask for it too. I mean, I, let's be honest. I asked for it a lot, but yeah. my, my point, my point is, is that like, you really had to want to be there, you know, to go out into the world looking like somebody from Mars, you really had to fucking want to be there. You know what I mean? But it's like, that's the thing. And, and those thrash guys, that was the same fucking thing. They really wanted to be there. You know, it's funny to think about Gilman street because my Gilman street was definitely the Phoenix theater in Petaluma. Oh yeah. Tom, oh, yeah. Tom Gaffey. And uh, who I, I feel Tom Gaffey should be in the rock and roll hall of fame. How much, uh, how much rock and punk and new wave and every kind of music he, he supported and put in there and still going on. Um, but these types of venues you know, especially during the pandemic are just, they're gone. And it, it, it's hard to think about, of course, we're probably going to go back to the old school of just renting VFW halls and Elks clubs and putting on your own shows. But these venues were monumental in creating 
full blown superstars where you could go learn up to be a band, you know? Well, I also think that, but I mean, you have to understand there's bands like dead city out there, the dead city punks. They're just throwing these fucking crazy outlaw shows out in the middle of Los Angeles, you know, where they're just fucking going off. You know what I mean? So there's still, you know, there's a will, there's a way. So my hat's off to those dudes, you know, cause that's punk as fucking fucking there. And they're, and not only that, but they're a great band. So, and they're doing these like outlaw shows and bands like section hate and shit are doing them too. And it's like, you have all this other stuff here. It's like, you know, well, you want to take away our fucking venues, then we're going to go fucking go play in the fucking aqueduct. You know what I mean? And we're going to throw a big ass show, but see, that's, that's the thing. That's the spirit, you know, and that's what punk rock will always be about. So, you know, I think, you know, whether or not there's venues for us to play in, and hopefully there always will be, you know, because, um, you know, obviously that's where we want to do our thing. But there, there's always that, that there's always another choice. And that's what I love about punk rock music and why it will survive for another thousand fucking years is because no matter how much it's going to be, try, you know, I don't care. It's still, you know, people don't respect it as much as they, 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 they you know, as much as it, it's been more into, into the public eye, people still don't respect that. I'm sorry. Because if they did, then you'd see bands like fucking Motorhead in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Let's right. just be honest. Right. Because. Right. I know the Ramones are there and that, and they should be, but Motorhead should fucking be there. Not fucking Chicago. I mean, what did Chicago really fucking do for rock and roll? I mean, for my rock and roll, nothing, absolutely fucking nothing. No, they're probably nice guys, whatever, but Motorhead, if there wasn't a fucking Motorhead, there never would have been the punk rock, the thrash metal. Their, their reach is so far and wide. Yep. They might not have sold millions and trillions of records, you know, right? Like, like, you know, but it's like, the, why aren't they honored the way, you know, like, I, I think about that all the time. If it wasn't for Motorhead, you'd never have Metallica. You'd never have GBH. You'd never have Rancid. Curl Sorry, Mags. You, Curl Mags. Any of the New York hardcore, like Agnostic Front. You'd never have any of these bands at all. That they were the stepping stone. They were the gateway drug, so to speak. Yeah. You know what I mean? Same with same with Devo, man. Devo and Kraftwerk, no nine inch nails. And and Gary Newman. Those three, you're not gonna have any kind of ministry. You're not gonna have any Devo, you know, those guys inspired everyone. Well, then you gotta throw in killing joke in there too. You yeah. know, if, you, if we're gonna go down that road. Yeah. So it's like and Devo true, it, it, it too as well, you know. So but I, you know, I feel like it's like when, when it comes to that hard, aggressive music, it's Motorhead. That's the catalyst. You know what I mean? That is the, where it all began, you know? Uh, what, how many years has it been now? I was trying to figure it out. Uh, and out comes the wolves. Is it 25 years? It's longer than that now. I mean, it's 90, 95. So 26, 26. Well, I mean, what year are we? Are 2021? So 90, 26 years. <laughs> Seems like yesterday, though. Seems like yesterday. It's crazy. When that record came out, I mean, Time Bomb, this fucking record was everywhere. And and this is when I really love when a band like Rancid hits and everybody's listening to it because you're like, holy shit, that's a smasher record. It is. I mean, there's girls driving down the road in a convertible Mustang listening to Time Bomb, you know, then there's dudes and at a construction yard listening to time but it, it was everywhere you know that was crazy the whole that whole time frame was was crazy because you know like i said we were just kind of these kids who just kind of you know we're playing what we thought was rock and roll and you know we were you know obviously grabbing from the jamaican ska and skin and reggae and stuff and so you know but when we were sort of multi kind of like um multi we we're very multicultural in our inspiration you know what i mean we, you know we we took from a lot of different things you know and not just the ska but you know the soul stuff too you know especially like the northern soul kind of stuff we took from the english punk we took from the american punk you know we took it all for, you know we were influenced by everything it's like i feel like that record a lot with, along with a lot of our other records and I, and i feel like every record's a little bit different than the last but i feel like you know if you look at the last 10 records, nine records we've done. However, I think number the new one's coming out is number 10. It's kind of a, 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 
I would say it's a look into our record collections. <laughs> you oh, know what that's I mean? cool. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, totally. so, and I think that, um, you know, that record in particular, where we were as a band, I, I, I don't know if we all knew that we were on the cusp of anything special or grandiose, or we didn't, I don't think we knew what was going to happen with that. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure I can say safely that we didn't. We were just, you know, kind of kept this attitude and, and, and I think it was like, uh, like an us against the world kind of thing. And we were just making music straight from the heart and everything that we were talking about on that record, you know, was so freaking close to home. You know, it was so, I mean, the names were changed obviously to protect the innocent, you know, but they were real people we were talking about. These were real exp- experiences. Jackal was a real dude who used to tag, you know, and died. So it's like, you know, these things that, you know, we were paying homage to those, you know, or we were talking about our experiences. And I think that, you know, that authenticity of that record, and it's not like it was anything we were trying to do. It's not something that was, that was like, um, pre, pre, uh, predetermined, preconceived. I don't know how to say it, but we weren't, we weren't going in there going, well, if we write this. In this, I mean, we were talking about like in avenues and alleyways. We were that was a unity song. I mean, we were seeing the racism and and the sexism and the bigotry in America, you know. And we were talking about it, and we were yelling "oi, oi, oi" with that, basically saying "oi" isn't some fascist right wing bullshit. This is our shit. It's about the working class. It's about blacks and whites. It's about anybody. Come along, join us. You know what I mean? And let's stand together through you know, the oppression, the bullshit, the systems, the, all these things, you know, and, um, and how the media was pitting everybody against each other yeah. and they still fucking do it. You know right what now. I mean? And it's like, you know, they're all bought by pharmaceutical companies and fucking, you know, big businesses where, you know, it's like the dystopian um, world that everybody's been predicting is fucking here, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, let's just be honest. Yeah, And it, it's not an, it's not a, a pro or anti statement. It just is what it is. And it's like, it's, it's not like it's a big fucking secret. You know I mean? Punk rock has been talking about this time, right? Fucking now for fucking 40 years. And, it, you know, so it's like, it, you know, everybody's acting like they're all shocked about it or they got to get along with the system or what. I don't know. That's a whole other podcast. But my point is, is that bring it back to outcome the wolves. It's, I just think it was just, it was lightning in a bottle and Mark, it was hold on. It, it, it's it, appetite for destruction. It's, it's master of puppets. It's, you know, it, it's chemistry captured on a piece of vinyl, you know, and, and you can't, you can't buy chemistry. It just either happens or it doesn't happen. You know? Yeah. I mean, I feel, but it took the personalities of the four different guys, even though we had the same, sort of mindset and the same sort of goal. And that was just to make an incredible record or to the best record to our ability. But I mean, I think about there was five songs that we, cause we ended up going in after we had finished what we thought was the record. And we, and we call it, we, and we still do it to this day. And we still call it, we call it demo days. Yeah. And it's basically songs that we have come up with while we've been writing the record. Maybe we didn't have enough time and we always take, a couple of weeks and then go back and then, Hey, we got five more. And I think about those five songs on that record, 11th hour, because when we went back to do them, there's 11th hour journey to the end of the East Bay, uh, disorder, disarray, the way I feel about you, all five of the ones that we, uh, little Sammy was a punk rocker or, uh, the wars in. So those five songs were songs that we had gone back in like, you know, a few days after we thought the record was done and redid. And so you think about all those, I mean, the reason why the 11th hour is called the 11th hour is because me and Tim were writing those freaking lyrics in New York. And that was the last song that he sang for the record. And that was at, it was, we, we were supposed to, we were at electric lady. We were supposed to be out of there at midnight. And he started singing it at 1115. Wow. So that's why that song is called the 11th hour. Cause we were like, it was going to be done. We, this needed to get, fucking done wow. you know what i mean because it was going to get mac uh mixed by andy wallace like literally the next day so i mean it, there's a lot of there's i mean so a lot of so those that record wouldn't have been that record without those five songs for mentioned that's you know? crazy how great is how great is electric lady on man it's really cool and you know then having jim carroll come in and and do the spoken word on us and it's like it was you know it was like and he did that in two takes wow he like he literally 
because he was there for some sort of because I remember they were doing the world premiere because the Basketball Diaries movie had just come out and he was yeah. there for the world premiere of the video on MTV or something and uh, he came, I we said hello he came into the studio he's like oh what are you guys doing you know working on and uh, you know we're just you know kind of getting familiar or whatever and uh, we had that part in Junkie Man and we're still trying to figure out what we we're actually going to do there we didn't know if it was going to be a guitar solo or whatever. And, uh, we decided like, Oh, maybe we could ask him. So we asked him and he's like, yeah, for sure. I'll totally. And we're like, well, okay, cool. So he goes, let me just listen to it. And so he listens to it once and, and he goes, okay, let me listen to it again. He grabs out a notebook out of his back pocket and starts writing. Wow. Then he goes in and he does it. Wow. It was like nuts. Wow. It like took, took all of maybe listening to the song, it, it listening to the song three times. Oh man. So, so maybe if that's a three minute song, so it took him 15 minutes, let's just say, oh. you know, and just delivered that thing. And that's of course where we got the name of that record because it was so poignant for us because at the time, you know, there was all that talk about, you know, are they going to go to a major label? Are they going to, I mean, could you, I, I always go like this. I cannot imagine if there was a Facebook or an Instagram or a Twitter back then. Oh, you they would have been mean? lighting you up. Oh, my you up. God. Oh, my it God. Because there was that thing where Madonna, you know, she had Maverick and she was yeah. just buying bands, man. Yeah. Yeah. And and I did want to ask you about that. Epitaph seems kind of like the heroes still right now. Were they? Am I right? Have they always done the bands right? Because they stuck to their, you know, to what they did. And you guys stayed there and exploded with that record because, you know, Epic wanted you. Madonna wanted you. Everybody wanted you, you know, after the, the you know, let's go record. Well, I, you know, the, I think our loyalty to Brett is pretty obvious. Like right. Brett was always a big, you know, he's obviously Mr. Brett from Bad Religion. So there's, there's that respect there. And, um, he was always like our dad. (laughs) I'm serious. I mean, he was a a big father figure to us and, um, he treated us like his kids, like how you love on your children. I mean, I've, I've, I've felt love in my life and I know what I didn't have a dad growing up. He was pretty much out of the picture early on, but, and I, but I've had father figures who, who've taken me in and, put their wing over me and tried to do their best to help guide me. Brett Gerowitz personally was one of those guys, you know, when I didn't have enough money to pay my rent, he gave me the money to pay my rent, you know what I mean? And never asked for it back. I was able to eventually to, to pay him. He had fully forgotten about it. He was just treating me, you know, and this is just me personally talking, you know, he treated me like a, like a son and I'll never forget that. And I think that like when, everything was going super fucking crazy at that time, you know, cause salvation had kind of blown up and green day had now blown up and offspring, offspring was blown up. And then everybody from under the sun was coming out, trying to, you know, sign us and not do some, most of them didn't even know who, we, who, what we looked like or what our real names were or, or any of that shit. So, you know, it's kind of easy to weed out the bullshit, you know, cause we're all smart street kids anyways. You know, we were obviously, we would be fools if we didn't, un- you know, didn't um, see what they had to say. You know what I mean? Of course. Of course. Like, Take the meetings, I, I always say. Well, yeah, but that's the thing. It's like, it, you know, I can, and that's the way I've lived a lot of my life. And I'll get into that later. But like, you know, as far as Epitaph and, and, and making that record with Epitaph, we only could have made that record on Epitaph. There's no, if we, if we would have, if you look back in retrospect and it has a, a rancid historian and I look back and we've talked about it a few times, Times as a band, it's like there's no way we could have made an out from the wolves if we were signed to Epic. It would have been a totally different record because we probably would have had more Maxwell Murder type of type, types of songs. I think because we probably would have felt like we couldn't. It, it would have been inauthentic for us to do. How's that? Yeah, yeah. Oh well, major label comes in and it's just like we need four more time bombs, you know. And yeah. then- they probably they probably never would have seen at that time what that song was. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. We had, and we always had this creative freedom. You know, we, we sort of like have always chose our own destiny. That's why we've had like 16 managers. Anytime that they try to control us, we're like, fuck you. We're, you know, who knows the band better than us? 
thank God now we have like, you know, Kevin and Dan or whatever, but, but Dan Hodge was also like the first, the first time he ever went out on tour was when Lars Fredericks and the Bastards back in 2001. And he was my TM, you know what I mean? And so now he's, you know, he, he's, he's the man, right? So it's like, you know, and Dan knows us because he ended up touring with Rancid. He became a guitar tech. He became, you know, this, this, and that. Now he's, he was the you know, TM for years. You know? And now he's running the show and thank God, because he knows us better than anybody else. He knows exactly what makes us tick, tick, exactly what would turn us off. And so any, any kind of bullshit he doesn't bring to our table because he knows that we're going to say fucking no to it or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, but, and, but that's why we, you know, he's been around, but my point is it's like Brett has been that consistent because he's given us that freedom. You know, we own our own, all, all of our catalog. We wow. own our records. Really? You know I mean? And Brett, Brett made that possible. Cause wow. like I said, he treats us like family. You know, he still comes in and produces our records. He's still producing this last record that we're finishing up right now. It should be out pretty soon. But it's like, you know, that's the thing. It's like, in the meantime, I'm going to do a little solo thing. You know what I mean? And I get to do that. And that's, it's all, the thing with Rancid is that we've always been able to express ourselves the way that we want to express ourselves. There's never been a guy going, you can't do that. And we're also like, you know, if some one guy doesn't want to do something, you know, it's not a majority rules with Rancid. You know, if one guy doesn't want to do something, we all go, okay, let's not do it. If one guy wants to do something, then it's like, well, let's present it and see what everybody thinks. And if we all agree on it, that's when we do it. And that's the way, that's why we've been a band for 30 fucking years and had one member change. And for, and it was a member change, honestly, you know, nothing against Brett Reed, but the, uh, getting Brandon Steinerker, who's been in the band probably now longer than Brett Reed ever was in the band, made us a better band. It added life to us, you know. Let's talk about the EP. Was there going to be a, was there going to be a Kiss song on this or something? There is a Kiss song. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Which one was it? It's coming home. Oh wow, wow, Kiss man. I I I, I you know. I've I, I say it every episode, but e- either people say the Beatles, it just depends what, uh, you know, how old they are the Beatles right. or the next age is up is Zeppelin. And then around my age, every guy that sits on the couch, it's it's kiss and Cedric yeah. Bixler from at the driving coined him as the gateway drug to rock and roll. You get kiss and then you go, you're off, you're off to the races, you know? Well, that that's kind of what happened to me. I mean, I remember being in, in Denmark, 1970, I guess it would have been 74, 75. No, because I had my third birthday over there. So, so 74, yeah, maybe 75. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Right. My brother, four years older than me, exposed to Kiss by this time. And my older cousin, who's, I think, 16 at the time, 15, 14, something like that, Danish. She knows that my brother likes Kiss. And plays him Slade. Oh, yeah. Sweet. Yeah. Chicory Tip. Yeah. Uh, T-Rex. And uh, little did I, later on, you know, I realized that how much of an influence those bands had on Kiss, right? So first band I ever heard, 1975, 1976, is Kiss. And that's through my brother. I'm four or five years old at Kurt Heindel's birthday party. And the reason why I'm invited there is because I'm Robert's little brother. Right. In 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 Kurt Heidnell's bedroom, I am staring up at the ceiling and there's a big poster on the ceiling of Gene Simmons splitting blood that scares the fucking shit out of me. Yeah. And it makes a lasting impression. For my fifth birthday, I get uh I think I get dressed to kill. Wow. Right? So yeah. fifth or sixth birthday. So I I was in the music way early on. My mom always had Danish like uh like the Danish um, music, whether it be like, it sounded like basically like what Oi is. It's just like a, a bunch of people in a bar swinging, you know, and singing. And Kenny Rogers and Engelbert Humperdinck and uh, Natalie Wood records. Um, I'm trying to think of what else was in her record collection. So she always liked music and liked the fact that we were into music. Because my, gran- my grandfather was a banjo player. Wow. As well as a very good athlete, you know, a goalie uh, for the, for the, uh, his town team. So seeing that kiss, getting, getting exposed, they were like, and then, you know, that's probably why I love pro- professional wrestling so much is because of kiss. But I remember getting those records dressed to kill, 
hearing getaway. And I was like, this is, this is it. It's like shivering, sing, you know, boom, boom, boom. Throughout the years, you know, obviously I, I, I would listen to coming home and it was always one of my favorite tracks, you know, and it meant different things to me. And I feel like, you know, about two and a half years ago, I went through my second divorce and I've got two children. It was really kind of like pretty gnarly, you know, it's literally the best thing that's ever happened to me. But at the, it was like the first time in my life where I was uh, the saddest I've ever been and the happiest I've ever been. And I was never able to hold those two emotions at the same time. We had just played Madison Square Garden around this time. And wow. Dan Hodge was saying, and that was like my bucket list, right? That was, I mean, I Saturday Night Live, check. Uh, Oakland Coliseum, check. You're right. Madison Square Garden, check. New bucket list. You know, just being able to step grace those stages was like a big deal. And so Dan would always go, dude, Dan Hodge, you need to like do some sort of Billy Bragg thing, like little Sammy, but like do that with other songs. And he'd been suggesting this to me for a long time. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to do it. Yeah. So I was living with my, my, one of my best friends in the whole wide world, Chris, and he plays in a hardcore band here called Powerhouse Singer. And uh, who who's the godfather of both of my kids? I said to Chris one time, I said, "Hey, I'm thinking about maybe doing like this solo gig." And he's also a promoter here. And I said, "Do you wanna? Do you think you wanna do a show?" And he's like, "Yeah, sure. I'll, you know, let's do it." I said, "Well, I think it's maybe only a hundred people are gonna come, anyways. I, you know, so let's base it off of that, and then maybe get a room that would be, you know, sort of comparable to that." And he's like, okay, cool. Let's do it. And he goes, I think there's going to be a lot more people, dude. And I was like, I don't know if we get a hundred, I'd be fine. You know, it's just me playing, you know, guitar or whatever. No one's going to be interested and, uh, sold out in, in six hours. You know what I mean? It was 400 and some odd people. I was like, whoa. So went and did the show and then started booking some more shows. And I was out on my way to go to the, to, to do some shows at the dropkick Murphy's. And as I'm on the plane, I knew for some instinctual reason to leave my phone on. And by the time that me and my 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 girlfriend Joanna, she's from Cape Cod, so we were planning on staying in Cape Cod at her parents' house. By the time we landed, all the shows had been canceled. Right, oh. so it shut everything down. Because I think my the show that I played by myself was March the seventh, and we were still kind of finding out what this the COVID was. And there was people who didn't show up that night. You know, right? Anyway. Yeah, my last show was March tenth. Same thing, sold out bunch of people not there like 40 of them you're like oh wow this, this yeah. is kind of weird you know? yeah exactly so you kind of realize and like well why did i sell this out and you know only 300 395 out of four you know what i mean like whatever point is come back home finally and i'm starting to get my bearings i'm like well we're going to be shut down for a while uh why don't i you know go into the studio and what well, it was obviously a few months afterwards and I called the engineer Michael Rosen, who did out oh, wow. the world. Yeah, Michael uh, Rosen. Yeah. So, and I, I've done a lot of my work. You know, um, the last Stomper record was he he uh, engineered uh, all the old from Casual stuff he's done, uh, some of the Oxley stuff. So anything that I that I do, I always go to Michael because me and Michael have been working together since Let's Go, right? So I said, hey, listen, I got these ideas for these all these new songs too, because you know. As they say, pain will can bring some of these things out of you. And I'd written about like 30 some odd new songs. And I and some some of them I was going to use for the casuals. Some of them I was obviously going to bring to the table for rancid or whatever. And I just, I just, I I was just, I was, it was just very pro prolific for me at that time. Cause I had nothing else to do. I was in, you know, feeling, you know, that was a, a tremendous sense of loss. You know, I wasn't living in, you know, the house that I'm in now. You know what I mean? I kind of left. And, um, but anyways, so went in with Michael and we sat there and I, and I recorded about 16 or 17 songs and it was just me and, and guitar. I just wanted to get the ideas. And then I was like, well, wait a second. Um, what if I did a Billy Bragg-esque kind of thing and put that out to kind of, to show people what I'm doing with this, you know, thing that I'm doing live. So then I started, my focus kind of shifted. And, and after I got the most, what I felt were the most important kind of newer songs out of the way, I re-recorded Skunks. And, uh, you know, a lot of these songs that, that you know, I had previously done in other bands. And I was like, well, fuck it. You know, coming home, I had Freeman 
at the show, Matt Freeman, I said, hey, listen, I want to do this Kiss song because it's pretty poignant for me at this point in my life. Would you want to, you know, join me up on the stage? He's like, fuck yeah. And I was like, well, if I can get Freeman to do a Kiss song, you know, with me in public, you know what I mean? Then we're, we're going to be good. So I, I, I did a UK subs cover. I did a Ramon song. You know, I did, I just, I kind of basically, when I did the live show, I basically kind of played songs throughout like my history. So I play, I touched on every band except for like Stomper and Oxley's. And, but I did like a UK sub song. I did some rancid songs, bastard songs, casual songs. So, and I was like, well, fuck it. I'm just going to put this out. And you know what? It's now, it's going to be a four part EP thing. So you're going to have, I'm going to release, you know, four of these. And the next three are going to be nothing but original tunes. I won't go back to the covers, but I wanted to kind of like put something out there, just kind of go, well, this is kind of what I'm doing now too. And um, so I added the Kiss song and the UK sub song. Because I, I, they were fun, and you know, and I figured, you know, it's something for you know. But then I, you know, got Kevin Bavona involved, who was who was who was in the Interrupters, and he's a great producer and a great engineer. And he's engineered a few Rancid records, and I was like, well, can you add some Hammond B or three and piano? And I got Dan Bohr to do some piano on on one of the songs, and um, you know, and I had Matt Freeman play the baritone mandolin on one song, and he played bass on another song, and so. And I just and and kind of made these songs, you know, uh, you know, very different than how I previously recorded them with the other bands, you know. Right, they right. Were, there was still the same spirit to them because I didn't want to go, you know, in eighty two, uh, you know, do some fucking hippie acoustic shit. So right. it's like it, there's still some snarl there. It's not like a country version of this song or a, a soul jazzy, you know, Lady Gaga thing of this or whatever. Um, I don't know why I said Lady Gaga. Yeah, 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 yeah. I saw, I saw the videos, man. They're great, skunks. That's a cool one. What, what arena is that? You're in, or a football field or whatever? That's the San Jose Earthquakes. So I mean, oh. grew up, grew up, you know, going to their games, and they used one of the old from Casual songs, a song I wrote as their sort of anthem. So, and and it's Sam, the guy who directed it. Um, he works for them, and he just, you know. Since I, uh, you know, I have a lot of history with the club, Sam said, hey, Lars wants to shoot a video. Can you go out in the middle of the pitch? And they were like, yeah, of course. So they just made it happen for me because they were out of town on the road. It's amazing. The earthquakes made it, man. You know, I remember the first inaugural season, you know, was that in the 70s? Jesus Fuck yeah. Christ. Like I was like, kid, and they're like, soccer's coming to California, <laughs> the San Jose earthquakes. And yeah. I remember I was playing soccer as a kid. So we went to see them play, you know, like a field trip. And uh, and here we are, 2021, the San Jose earthquakes are still around. Well, you know, they've had their ebbs and flows and they've lost their organization a few times over the years and they went yeah. indoor, but, you know, and then we came into San Jose Blackhawks for a hot minute and, you know, but I always loved that, you know, soccer and football, as they say, you know, I mean, when I'm over in England, I got my team over there that I always go see. And yeah. so I'm passionate about the game. I love, I love sports and I, and, and, you know, I, I love the Oakland Raiders. I'm an Oakland A's fan. I, I will not never call them the Las Vegas Raiders. There'll always be the Oakland Raiders. Even when they were in LA, there were the Oakland Raiders, Oakland A's, San Jose Earthquakes. I'm not really a basketball guy, but my kids are. We went just went to uh, Golden State. Yeah, we went to a Warriors game for my uh, youngest birthday, and they they beat the OKC. So I'm starting to learn more about basketball because they're into it. You know what I mean? And that's the thing. Kids will steer you down these paths and and i just want to be closer to them so if it's through a freaking sports team or anything else you know i'm gonna bring do it, it on bring it on when's the ep come out i believe it's in november i want to say it's the 29th of november oh, it's going to be um <clears throat> there but i'm gonna you know but you know obviously you can pre-order it right now and you can pre-order the 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 cassette the cd and the vinyl and uh i think you can pre-order the digital as well so but I think the release release is the 29th of November cassette. Yeah. I love hearing that. Well, you know what? I love cassettes. You know, I love, I mean, I still have a shit ton of them and I still, I have like four or five boom boxes. So it's like, you know, I, I go to those every once in a while because, and I feel like I have a record player, obviously I have a cassette player, 
I have, um, you know, through the boom box, I have another boom box that has a CD player in it. Cause sometimes you just want to do, you want to hear your music in different formats and it keeps me interested. You know what I mean? And that, that's the thing, you know, most importantly, cause my life gets a little bit crazier being a single dad and these things. Now it's like, you know, time for music is, is always, you know, it's, if I'm, if I'm going out and changing the record every five minutes and I'm being pulled away from something or, so if I just can put it on, push play and walk away and then there's music going on in the house or whatever, it's a good feeling, you know? So yeah. are you, are you a comedy guy? I see Tim at my shows uh, quite a bit. I got a funny Tim story. He was, I, I hadn't seen Tim, you know, ever in person, except for on videos, you know, and last Tim I know is just how he looked in the video. So now he's got the giant, you know, ZZ top beard and, and you know, he, he comes up and we're talking. He's like, yeah, that's a good set, man. And I was like, yeah, I was wearing a Ramon's shirt and we we're talking Ramon's. I go, yeah, I think I've seen him like 10 times or something. He goes, yeah, I think I've seen him 61 times to be precise. <laughs> and, I, and I was thinking like, what is this dick talk? You know, like, like exact number and stuff. And they cruised away. And my friend's like, oh, that's Tim Armstrong, dude. And I was like, oh yeah, he did see it. Cause he was on tour with him. <laughs> Hilarious. That's his, that's his band. That he, yeah. That's his, to my motorhead, Tim is the Ramones. He knows everything about that band, loves that band more than anything. You know, he's seen them, you know, you know, I'm, I, I think, he would know exactly how many freaking times he's seen him because yeah. that's just the way he is. Yeah, I loved and, it. I loved and, it. Because I know exactly how many times I've seen Motorhead. So it's like, I get it. That was my band. You know what I mean? And yeah, but yeah, I love comedy. I, I think laughing is very important. I think laughing is, is, is the best. I mean, we all have to laugh at ourselves. And if we have, if, we, if there's, you know, comedy is not there to hurt people's feelings. It's there to make people think and to make fun of ourselves. You know, right. it's there to prove a point. It's there. You know, I think comics don't really have an agenda at the end of the day, other than making you fucking laugh. And if they have another agenda in that agenda, which is making you laugh and it makes you think, then that's what we want. We need people in this world to bring different perspectives, to bring different kinds of you know ideas across well that's you know what, what archie saying? bunker did that's, you know that's important archie bunker basically carol o'connor uh played a buffoon a racist an idiot and he did that to show you how dumb that type of person is and he was genius at it exposing the insanity of uh, a human being like that and right Comedy is a lot like that. We're saying we're saying the things that make you think, oh, this is funny. But, oh, man, is it true? You know, well, look at Lenny Bruce and guys like that who yeah. really like push the envelope, you know, yeah. you know, look at Benny Hill or, you know, the list goes on and on and on. And yeah, Robin Bill Williams. Hicks, Bill Hicks, Bill Hicks. Yeah. I, mean, do you, I think the culture would be so much fucking different if Robin Williams was still alive. Yeah, because he would have called out a lot of shit. That a lot of people like, you know, guys like Dave Chappelle are are are, are pushing buttons. And I yeah. think that's what comedy and music should fucking do. I only like dangerous stuff, man. Dangerous comedy, dangerous music, it dangerous films. Yes. That's it, it man. That's it. It doesn't make you see the thing about a joke is it's not necessarily to I don't think at the end of the day to degrade anybody. No. You know what I mean? There's been jokes made about me. There's been jokes made about every human being, right? In every culture, every race, every color, every facet. You know what I mean? It's just the way it is. So it's like, it's one of those things where I feel like comedy is one of those places that is just can be the free for all. It's the benign anarchy. It can be whatever it can be. And I think that the same way about music. I think everybody has to be fucking accountable at some point too, you know, but, but I feel like in a performance, you know, I've just come from this school. It's like art or anything else. If, if it's there, it's, it, if it's coming out of somebody, it's for a reason. And if you're not given the platform to grow and to mature, how the fuck do you think you're going to change anything? Yeah, that's true. It's great talking you know, to you, man. Great talking to you too. And, uh, congrats on all your success rancid Thanks, is a fucking smoker in the history of music and especially in the bay area 
and uh, looking forward to, uh, you know, meeting you in person, maybe come see some comedy. I'll come see you guys play. Sounds I can't good. wait for the new Rancid record. And I can't wait for your EP to come out. The videos are great. I saw three Thank of them. You. And uh, hit me up anytime, man. I'm up in the Bay Area uh, on and off here and there. Thank you, Dean, for having me, buddy. I love you, brother. Thank you. Take it easy, bro. I'll see you.